Ghosts of Christmas Past is a series that we're in. And the next few sermons um, that I'm going to be sharing with you guys are, are very important. Can I say that? Is that okay for me to say? I don't say that in any kind of arrogant way, but they're just some very important messages for us to get. And I think today is, is, is one as well. Um, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the 103rd division of the book of Psalms. And I actually would love to read in your hearing 14 verses, 14 verses. Psalms 103, starting at verse 1. I'd love to read 14 verses in this incredible psalm of a very familiar character in the Bible by the name of David. And here's how David begins his psalm. You can follow along with me. That's the New Living Translation. I'm in the New American Standard. But here's what it says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons how many everybody? Who pardons all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgment, judgments for all who are oppressed. I thought somebody would say amen to that, especially with what some of y'all have been through. The Lord, the, the Lord just said he performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. I'm going to say amen for everybody who's been oppressed for you. Y'all got to wake up out there. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. For he has, not, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself, listen to this, for he himself knows our frame and he is mindful that we are but dust. I want to talk to you for the next few moments, the ghost of forgiveness. Let's pray. Father, we need you today. Clear our minds from all distractions because there's something that you need us to get that we haven't yet gotten. So spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen and amen. Andy Stanley has this incredible quote where he says this, your present becomes your past and your past shows up in your future. I want to say that again, your present, what you're doing right now, the moment you do it, immediately will become your past, and eventually, what he says is your past shows up in your future. The idea being, you got to be careful of what you do now, because what you do now, yes, will one day be your past, but the things we do now that are in our past show up and have a profound effect on our future. I wish I had heard that a little while ago because when I was uh, 14 years old, one of the things that my mother was very big on was making sure that I did not bring home a baby premature. I was big. Weed, we can work with that. <laughs> Drink a little beer, okay, we'll talk. But, but if you bring home a child, she said, I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you with that. She said, I got one, that's all I need. She said, I ain't raising no more babies before it's my time. 
So in my mind, what I, I had to put together, that was the thing that you don't do. You don't have babies before, you know, you get married. And so the one way that you can have children, one of the ways, I know it's 2019, so you can do some different things. I said, as long as I don't have sex, I'm going to be cool. And, and so I was like, cool, no sex. But, but there's some vegetarian stuff I found out about. See, at 14, 15, you know, 16 years old, I wasn't a meat eater. I was a vegetarian. And so I found out that if you flavor vegetarian stuff right, it still tastes good. You can't get a baby that way. Because one of the things that, that my mother did, and just bless her heart, of course, she's doing the best she can do. You know, sometimes we tell our children not to have sex, but we don't tell them how to be pure. So, you know, I'm 14, you know, 15 years old, you know, doing my vegetarian thing. And, you know, that, that was just that. That was it. You know, you just, you're experimenting. You're trying. You're doing different things. You're, you're doing that different kind of stuff. And it's fine because years go on. And, you know, I'm pastoring, you know, end up getting, you know, married and pastoring in, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, pastoring in Colorado. And by the time I come to Rubidoux, I'm, I'm 29 years old. This is 14, 15 years ago between all this different kind of stuff. And so, you know, you don't even think about some of the stuff you did at 15 and, and, and 16 years old until my first day here at Rubidoux. Some of the young ladies at 14 and 15, decided that they wanted to welcome me on my first Sabbath here and sit right behind Tia. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> to be in a room and know that there are multiple people in that room that know what you look like without your clothes on. Some of y'all feeling that right now. Because at 14 years old, I didn't think that the things in my present that one day were going to be my past, 15 years later show up in my future. And one of the things, you know, when I was living here in California and growing up, I didn't know Jesus the way I know him now. And so there's a lot of different things. And it's so funny that some of the people that, that I did not know Jesus with now want to find Jesus at Rubido. Like Jesus is at Kansas too. And, and, and so sometimes, can I just be real and transparent with you? Sometimes there, there are reminders of my past that show up in my future because of things I did at 14, 15, 16 years old that are still showing up today, and I'm 40 years old. The past ain't no joke, is it? The past is serious, has a nasty habit of showing up at times that we least expect it. Character habits, individuals, circumstances and situations, all of this stuff. And we actually see this played out beautifully in a movie that a lot of us maybe watch during this holiday season called A Christmas Carol. Y'all familiar with that? A Christmas Carol. Charles Dickens, as he writes this, is this about this trifling dude by the name of, excuse me, Ebenezer Scrooge. And you sit there and you look at Scrooge as you first, if you first time you saw the movie or read the book, and you're wondering, why is this dude so mean? Like, why is he this way? Why is Christmas awful? Just for the first time you've seen the film, obviously you've seen it before probably, you're wondering, what is this dude's problem? And then what happens is in order for us to understand his present, we have to understand his past. So the ghost of Christmas past comes. And takes Ebenezer Scrooge back to some moments in his childhood, some moments that, 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 that he was teased and that he was rejected, other moments where he was about to get married but made a different decision because money was more important to him than love. And so what we do is to understand Ebenezer Scrooge's present, we've got to understand his past. And because of certain things that happened in his past that weren't dealt with in the present, we then get a taste of what his future is going to be like. The past while it's in the past, still has a way of tugging at us, doesn't it? Pulling at us. And, and what it does is the past literally is a sum of the decisions that we made, both good and bad, that have profound effect on us now, and if not properly dealt with, will deal with us in our future. Some of your past shows up on the day you say I do. Some of your past shows up in the new job. But the past, if not dealt with, will get you. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because there's some stuff that we as human beings don't want to deal with that was in our past. 
But if you want to move forward successfully into 2020, there's some stuff that happened this year that became your past that if we don't deal with, will destroy us in the years to come. They'll destroy us. And so that's why I want to go through this series. I want to deal with a few things when it comes to our past. And here are the three things that I'm going to deal with as I'm going to be, uh, I'll be here for the next, you know, six weeks. And I'm going to be dealing with this for the next three. Today, I want to deal specifically with the ghost of forgiveness. Next week, the ghost of shame. And then the week after that, the ghost of failure. All of these things that have taken place in our past. And I want to talk about this thing called forgiveness today because I think this is a very huge theme that takes place all throughout the Bible. This concept of forgiveness, it's huge when understanding Christianity. If you want to explain Christianity to somebody, you cannot explain Christianity without dealing with the subject of forgiveness. Because here's the ultimate thing about Christianity which makes this religion so incredible and amazing. The religion simply says this, that when we make mistakes, when we make bad decisions and we mess up, there is somebody there who covers our mess ups. Does that make sense? So let me bring it a little closer to home. Uh, I, I praise God that, 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 that I am debt-free as far as my, you know, my credit cards and all that foolishness, foolishness. Remember, we told you credit cards are the devil. What are they, everybody? What are they, everybody? They're the devil. And, and, and let me tell you what is so horrible about this. And, and here's the thing. You got to look at this idea of forgiveness. What happens is when we're born into this world, we get a credit card of sin. It's just automatically there. And you and I have a propensity to run up that card. That's what we do. We run from sin to sin. There's lust, and then there's lies, and then there's, there's cheating, and there's, there's envy, and there's, and there's putting other gods before. And what we do is we have all kinds of fun. Isn't it fun when you can just run up a credit card? Come on, because the money's not coming necessarily out of your account. You don't see it. That's one of the tricks. I hope you do know. Back in the day when you were just spending cash, you didn't spend as much. But now that you got plastic... It doesn't feel like as much is coming out because you just swipe and swipe and swipe. But then at the end of the month, there's this credit, there's this, there's this balance that comes up, isn't there? And when you look at the balance, you say to yourself, well, wait a second. The reason I put it on a credit card is because if you could have afforded it. So literally, when you get a credit card, most of us get a bill we can't afford. And it's cool when you're like 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, you come from a certain place and you call your parents and you just send them, you know, kind of the bill. But for most of us, when we were growing up around the credit card, you had to take care of that by yourself. Come on now. But here's what God's thing says. He says, look, y'all, here's a credit card called sin. Now, the reason I have to give you the credit card is because part of this credit card means you have free choice. Now, what I'd love for you to do with the free choice is take a bunch of scissors and clip up the credit card. But y'all don't do that. What y'all do is go around running away. So until you get to the point where you don't want to run up that bill anymore, when the bill comes, send it to me. Now, what you know is what God doesn't do. He does not forgive your debt. He forgives you and pays for the debt himself. See, see, somebody got to pay for that balance. And the awesome thing about forgiveness is that God says, give me your bill. I'll pay for it and treat you and let you get the credit score that really belongs to me. Forgiveness is awesome, but... Forgiveness comes with conditions because that's a deal of a lifetime, y'all. Isn't that a deal of a lifetime? You run up the card. Jesus pays the bill. You get a zero balance and a good credit score. But there's conditions that come with that. Because not only do we have a credit card of sin that is between us and God, but we also have a credit card of sin that's between us and each other. And we run that card up too. And what some of us do is we run up the card with each other, and when somebody owes you something, you hold that debt over their head, but when you owe God something, you want him to pay for it. And here's what God says very clearly in the Bible. He says, if you're not willing to deal with somebody else's debt and forgive them, then guess what? I can't forgive you. Forgiveness, he says, is dependent on the fact that you use the same kind of spirit, the same kind of attitude that I have used towards you in forgiveness, you've got to use towards others. So here's what I want you to do for a moment. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think of somebody that needs to be forgiven in your life. I just want you to think of somebody. You got them? Yeah, I can see some of y'all sweating. You got that person? Okay, so you got them. 
How many of you, when you thought of that person, thought about yourself? Because we've heard all kinds of sermons about forgiving others. But today, I need to talk about the hardest person to forgive. And that's you. Because see, what we've got to understand is this text, when Jesus talks about, if you don't forgive others, I can't forgive you, does not simply apply to us forgiving one another. It also applies to us being able to forgive ourselves. And there are a lot of us who have a hard time forgiving ourselves. Now, the question I have to ask myself as I'm putting this together, why is it so hard for us to forgive ourselves? Like, why is it really a hard thing to do? And I think there's a, a couple reasons for that that I want to lay out before we get to where we're going today. One of the reasons I think that it's hard for us to forgive ourselves is we've never really truly seen forgiveness modeled in our families. We've seen people accept apologies. I'm just teaching today. I'm not preaching to y'all today. We've seen people accept apologies, but I can be very transparent with you. In my family, there is not a culture of forgiveness. We hold grudges. We don't talk to each other for months and years at a time. We don't, we we, we don't, when someone messes up, makes a bad decision, no matter how harmful or hurtful it is, we don't let that thing go. And I know that because when we show up to different dinners and different parties, you can see people's blood boiling over. I will never forget that there was one birthday party, not going to give you all the details, but, but we were in the middle about to sing happy birthday and something from 10 years ago just exploded in that mess and the birthday party turned into a disaster. Why? Because somebody still held on to something. And that's what I saw. I don't see people literally forgiving one another. And to be honest with you, even when I didn't see that in my family, I'm going to take it a step further. I didn't even see it inside of church. I don't see that. Like, that's not modeled. We don't see each other getting on one another's nerves and making bad decisions and calling people out, talking about them, hurting them in different ways, and then genuinely being able to forgive that person and move on in life. We hold it. So because I don't see it, now I'm going to have to do it to myself. How can I do something to myself that I've never seen someone even do to other people? I think the second reason that we have a hard time forgiving ourselves is because the thing that sometimes we need to forgive ourselves for the most is usually a secret we don't want anyone to know about. Like, like something happened. Maybe, and I'm just throwing examples out, maybe there was some abuse, sexual or physical, taking place in your family, and you knew about it, but you didn't say anything. And that person now continued to go through this different kind of abuse. And you know sometimes how we do, particularly in some of our families, you know, we, 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 we don't want to tell, we don't want to say anything. But now because we didn't tell, somebody else's life has been completely destroyed. And now you're seeing the results of that life. And you know deep down in your heart that if I had opened up my mouth, that person would have been free. They would have been set free. They wouldn't have dealt with half the stuff that they went through if I had just said something. And so now you're beating yourself up about something that you could have done that you didn't do, but yet you can never really deal with it because the moment you deal with this thing, it no longer becomes a secret. And then like we'll talk about next week, if somebody else finds out about this secret, now shame comes in. So if I forgive myself, I've got to deal with this thing, but if I deal with it, it becomes in the open. It's no longer a secret. And we love secrets. We're actually good at hiding them. And don't worry, we got it honest in our DNA. Because the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, the first thing they tried to do was keep it a secret. I think the third reason that we don't forgive ourselves is because at the end of the day, we actually don't believe we're worthy of forgiveness. We don't believe we're worthy. To be quite honest, we have done some pretty trifling things in this life. All of us have. See, some people's triflingness is just more visible than others. But we've all done some, some pretty bad things to each other and all that. 
And not only have we done some bad things, but here's a culture that we've even created. We'll talk about this on the last Sabbath. It's so interesting. The Bible says that a just man falls seven times and gets back up again, but we make people feel bad for falling. And the Bible didn't just say a man falls seven times. It says a just a just man falls. But when we fall, what ends up happening is the way that we talk at each other and to each other and describe what they've done. You see, we have changed it. When somebody messes up, we don't attack and deal with what they did. We deal with who they are as a person. We touch it. See, you did this. That means you must be this kind of person. And if I'm that kind of person who would do that kind of thing, then how can a person like that be worthy of forgiveness? So now you need to be forgiven for something, but you can't because you now, when you think about your own life, don't see enough value in yourself, not simply because of you, but because of the atmosphere and environment that has been pressed around us. We don't believe that we are worthy of forgiveness. We have to forgive ourselves. It's a mandate from God. Someone give us a few steps on how we can forgive ourselves. Y'all sit with me? In order to do that, though, we first have to define what forgiveness actually is. Um, forgiveness is the release of resentment or anger. Did y'all catch that? It's the release of resentment or anger. Now, let me tell you what's not true. When someone says you ought to forgive and forget, that's not true. God doesn't even do that. You think God forgets what you've done? And we, we treat God that way. Well, you know, the Lord forgets my sins. And so what we do is we sin in five minutes ago, and then we come to God and act like we didn't do that five minutes ago. Well, God, you forgave me, so, you know, you don't remember what it is. Let me tell you, we're engraved in the palms of his hands. Those aren't tattoos just for, you know, for looks. Those are there because of the decisions that we have made. But here is the beauty about God, and here's the thing about forgiveness. God's ability, he says, I don't forget what you've done, but I don't hold it against you anymore. And so if someone's wronged you or hurt you, forgiveness is not you forgetting that thing, that thing happened. Forgiveness is saying, oh, no, it happened. I'm good now. When I see you, I don't want to knock your block off. When I see you, I don't secretly in my own mind start cussing you out. When, when I see you, I don't start silently praying psalm prayers on your life. Y'all know what psalm prayers are? Lord, deal with my enemies. May they be crushed under your foot. Come on now. Like, 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 so, so what this is, forgiveness is a release of resentment or anger. And here's a great example of it. I think what it is, one of the games we used to play growing up is tug of war. Y'all remember that tug of war? Tug of war is an incredible game where you take this rope and everybody would hold on to this thing and everybody just starts pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And here's what was hilarious. The, the, the only way that the rope has all this tension and the only way that you have this strain is if both parties are just pulling in the opposite direction. But let me tell you what some of us would do. When somebody was pulling extra hard, one of us would just <laughs> let go. And when we let go, it was the ones who were still holding on that. <laughs> see, see, here is what the issue is with this idea of forgiveness. When we don't forgive even ourselves, it's like this tug of war. And I'm going to tell you, you keep pulling and pulling and it's tiring to pull. It wears on you to pull and to pull and to pull. And what forgiveness is, is when I say, I'm letting go. It's hilarious. Another story about this idea uh, of letting go. There was this uh, young man who was, who was physically, uh, mentally, excuse me, challenged, and he went to go use uh, the restroom. And, and with you, they installed these new restrooms, uh, you know, in the bathroom where, you know, you don't need to actually flush the toilet. And what the young man did is he made a huge mess inside of the toilet, made this huge mess inside the toilet. And he wanted to leave, but he doesn't want to leave a mess in the toilet because he does not do that. wants to make sure that it all goes down. But his problem was, 
He was standing there in front of this thing, and he was seeing all this mess. And he's like, I got to get rid of this mess. I got to get rid of this mess. He was frustrated, angry, couldn't find the button to flush. But what the young man didn't know is that there's an automatic sensor, and the only time it flushes is if he turns and walks away. But the longer he stays in front of his mess, it's just going to stay there. And forgiveness is when I look at the mess, I look at the anger and resentment, and I walk away from it. Forgiveness also is when you step into your present rather than anchoring yourself in the past. Do you notice the difference here? Stepping into the present and not anchoring the past. See, we want to deal with our past, but don't set your anchor down in there. That is what some of us do. We pull up our ships into the past, and we drop that anchor, and we are like, we will not be moved. All that anger and resentment continues to pile up. Forgiveness, listen to this. I'm going to tell you what forgiveness is. We just want to define it very quickly. Forgiveness is not saying what happened was okay. It's not saying it's okay. It's not saying that it's okay. Forgiveness is choosing to accept what happened as it happened rather than what could or should have happened. Are y'all following me? Forgiveness also, I want to make something very clear, is also not necessarily reconciliation. It's a whole other step in the process. More on that later. Uh, uh, um, but we got to ask ourselves this, though. If I'm not willing to reconcile after I forgive, why? I can forgive my abuser. We don't need to be friends, though. I can forgive the person who stole from the church, but they don't need to be treasurer again. But I, can, but I don't have the resentment, the anger in my heart. And when we understand this idea and concept about forgiveness, I want you to think about how hard this is. And let's just be honest, in, in, especially particularly in the black community, and I get this, I get this. Uh, um, a white police officer walks to an apartment building, says she thought it was her home, takes out her gun, pop, 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 shoots an unarmed black man in his own house. That's why I can't believe y'all didn't shout and the Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed, but all right. Her court case sent people crazy, though, because here's this young white woman, killed a black man. His brother gets on the stand when the victim's family is allowed to speak, and he offers her forgiveness. And folk were up in arms. And the reason they were up in arms is they didn't understand forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean that it's okay. Forgiveness doesn't mean that we're going to be friends all of a sudden, but what forgiveness means is what this brother was saying is, look, what I felt for you before, I don't feel now. It's forgiveness. If that makes sense to me, you say amen. Here's a couple of things that help us with this idea of forgiveness. Um, in order for us to truly embrace this idea of forgiving ourselves and, and, and really what God is trying to get us to understand is forgiveness, forgiveness also means we have to gain a more balanced view of the offender and the event. Do you hear what I said? A more balanced view of the offender and the, and the event. You see, forgiveness and a huge part of forgiveness is looking at this thing from as many angles as I can to see what actually took place. And here is what I found the hardest thing is in forgiving other people. I just want to use that for a moment is because we don't see ourselves in the offender. You see, I, I, want, you, I want that to sink in. See, if I have such a hard time forgiving anybody in my life, it's because I have not ever looked at this situation and put myself where they are. Because when I put myself where they are, I recognize that had a circumstance been different, had the way maybe I was raised been different, I easily could have been the one doing that wrong. And so now when I look at you through, I could easily be that person doing that to somebody else. Now the way that I treat you and handle this thing called forgiveness is different because I see myself in you. That's hard, isn't it? Because ain't nobody want to see their, th themselves in the wrongdoer, but that's the issue with Christianity. We are always the wrongdoers to someone, even him. 
The second thing I think that's helpful about this idea of forgiveness is decreasing negative feelings toward the offender and potentially increasing compassion. The third thing, giving up the right to punish the offender further or to demand restitution. We love to punish people. And it's so funny. We are a judge with everybody else but a lawyer with ourselves. We Johnny Cochran with ourselves, man. Now, what are some quick steps I want to give you, if you want to write these down, I think it'd be helpful, on how we can forgive ourselves. The first thing we have to do is recognize the injury. What happened? Like, what is it that actually took place? And when it comes to forgiving ourselves, we need to spend some time dealing with, examining the injury we caused ourselves or that we caused to somebody else. I got to think about that. I was doing some spring cleaning the other day. And I found this letter that Gianna wrote me over six years ago now. As I was reading this, I saw the hurt that I caused my 10-year-old daughter. And in that moment, I realized I hadn't forgiven myself for that. I, I just hadn't. There was some stuff that had taken place in the dynamics of my family that crushed my daughter. And I've been holding on to it. And, and, and so in that moment, I'm sitting there reading the letter. I'm sitting down, just going on the floor. I'm, I'm, I'm bawling my eyes out. And for the first time, because sometimes when you're in it, you don't deal with it the right way. Sometimes you got to take a step back. But, but as I'm sitting there in it, reading the letter, letter once, twice, three, four times, I mean, just reading it over and over and over and over again, I'm finally able for the first time to recognize the injury that her father, who was sworn to protect her, her father that was sworn to make sure that anything in life that would happen, I would take the hits. But now the one who said was going to take the hits had actually done the hitting. Like my actions, my things had caused my child that much pain. And I could not forgive myself until I came face to face with the injury. And there are some of us. That you know some of the stuff you've done with your kids. I'm just using children as an example right now. You've done with your kids. You've done with your brother and your sister. And, and, and you try to push it away because it's scary when you recognize what you've done to somebody. How you've hurt them. How you've torn their life and, and put it into different pieces. But if we want to move to being able to forgive ourselves, you've got to come face to face with the injury. That we caused. That we did. I did it. Nobody else, not the devil, nobody else. I did it. And that's how we have to be. You have to recognize what that injury is. It's only then when you recognize the thing that was done to the spouse, to the kids, to the family member, the brother, the sister, the person at your job, whatever it is, when you recognize whatever injury was caused, it's only then that we can begin to forgive ourselves. Only then. The second thing that you have to do is you have to identify the emotions that are involved. As we clarify the ways that we have injured others or ourselves, a familiar set of emotions start to come into play. Usually those emotions are fear, guilt, shame, and anger. And when you're looking at the injuries, you have to really identify, like as a result of this injury, what is the emotion that I have personally been experiencing because of this injury? Have I been angry because of it? Have I felt shame? I know for me personally, it wasn't as much shame as it was guilt. I felt so guilty for what I had done. And I had to identify that because I got to deal with anger different than I deal with guilt. I got to deal with shame different than I deal with, uh, with fear. And what we have to do is say, okay, what did I do? This is what I did. What have I felt? This is exactly what I felt. And then here's what you also have to do after you've done that. The third thing, you have to express that feeling to somebody in some way. Because if not, you just keep it a what? Just keep it a secret. You just keep it within. It just sits there. It sits inside of you. And so some of you are like, man, I'm not comfortable expressing that to somebody. Well, here's the thing you do. Write a letter to yourself. Sit there and say, I feel this way. 
because I did this. And you write that letter. You get the feeling and emotion out. You've got to deal with it. You don't sit there and, and kind of talk it away in the sense of just real quickly in your mind. No, you got to spend some time in this thing because it's serious. It's serious. Express the emotion. Then finally, second to last, is you really have got to get to the place where you let it go. Because guess what we can't do? This isn't back to the future. I can't travel back in time and change what happened. But I can deal with and accept it. But the question is, and that's a hard one, I think the hard one is being able to let go. Why is it so hard for us to let go? I know what the injury is. I know what the feeling is attached to it. I've expressed it. But pastor, you're asking me now to let it go, but I can't let it go. It's too hard for me to let go. And here's what I'm going to spend the rest of our time with today is I believe the reason that we have a hard time of letting go is because most of us don't understand the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Nah, we don't get it. We don't get it. We don't get it. I'm going to tell you why. Years ago, Muslim brother came to our church a couple years ago. He wanted to meet me. We had an awesome talk. He's a serious Muslim. He was like, man, can I talk to you about your religion? I said, sure. He said, sure, no problem. He said, I got a problem with Christianity. I said, well, what's your problem? He said, you guys have a religion that doesn't hold people accountable. I said, what are you talking about? He says, think about the premise of your religion. You mess up, somebody else takes the blame. He said, I must be reading something. He says, you have this prophet called Jesus, who when y'all mess up, here's all y'all have to do. You pray to him and you believe your whole foundation for your religion is based on the fact that when y'all messed up, somebody came down here to earth, died on a cross, and die for your stuff. Y'all don't take any accountability. He said, help me understand that. And I said, bro, I got to keep it real. What you just described is the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I, I said, bro, I said, I wish it was different because we have got this incredible thing where the gospel says, y'all mess up, but if you can connect with this individual by the name of Jesus, Jesus has forgiven all trust, but like all of our stuff is forgiven by Jesus Christ. And I've come to this conclusion that most of us agree with the Muslim brother because at the core, we got a problem with the gospel. Because we don't walk around like forgiven people. Now, we'll break that down theologically. We'll give somebody a study on amazing facts and tell them the facts of this. But when it comes to practically living that way, no. No. And I know that to be true, and that is why we walk around with so much shame, and that's why we walk around so miserable, because we don't believe in that part of the gospel. So I want to break down Psalms 103. I want to do that quick. Don't be scared of the time. I'm going to get through this quick. Psalms 103. The Psalms are actually songs and poems written in some cases directly to God or written to other people about God. And this particular writer of this song, you can see David in the booth with his headphones on. Doesn't even need a beat yet. Because see, the songs are coming from a different place. So you know, some of the best songwriters, that you can't sing and write a song about a heartbreak unless you had your heart broken. Come on now. But you can tell, Whitney's been through some stuff. Talking about I will always love you, and all that different kind of good stuff. I mean, the way Whitney sings her song, girl, you've been through something. When people come up here and sing, you can tell they've been through something. They've been through something. So in the Psalms, this is a Psalm 
of David. And look at what David says. Look what David says. This is crazy. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. And look at what the first thing that David says when it comes to one of the benefits of God. He says, the benefit of God is he pardons all iniquities. Okay, Lord, they, they, they don't get it yet, so I'll give them this next part. There's about six different words for sin in the Bible. Six. That's how trifling we are. There's six different words that can apply to each of us when it comes to this thing called sin. One of the most basic forms of sin is the Greek word hamartia. And what hamartia gives this particular impression, um, I, I picked up uh, just recently, and I just got to tell you, I was going to actually do it on stage, but I almost killed the praise team by uh, shooting a bow and arrow through the window. Uh, so I'm not going to do that on stage. I'm just going to tell you about it. Is that okay? Um, and, and so what, what, what this is, is hamartia and this way of sin gives righteousness this idea of a target. Okay? Righteousness is his target. Uh, what we have is a bow and arrow. And I, as a person who's taken, you know, and, and done archery, I'm skilled. I know how to hit a target. But sometimes, guess what I do? I miss. I, I, I miss the target. I'm aiming right. I'm trying to get it. I'm learning all the stuff that I've learned, but I still miss it. I still miss it. That's hamartia. That's sin. But there's another word here for sin, which is translated into English, which is called iniquity. And iniquity means this. When I've got all the skill, I see exactly where the target is. Pull my bow back, but I aim at something else. Intentionally. I ain't trying to hit that target because I want to go put it through the window. Bang. I just want to hit that over there. Bang. Iniquity actually can be defined as this as well. Pure wickedness. Intentional evil. And I want you to notice that David does not say simply, and uh, forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of your hamartia, that when you're trying to do right and still mess up. But David says God's forgiveness is so deep that even when you intentionally, even when you are full of wickedness, even when you wake up and say, I know what wrong is and I'm still going to do wrong. I know I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say it. No, I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it. I know I shouldn't. Got the power, got the accountability. I just want to do wrong. David says God covers all that. Are y'all still with me? God forgives us when we fail intentionally. Some of us come here plotting foolishness to do when you leave. This is just your fix to make you feel better about what you're going to do. Come on, I'm going to keep this real. I'm talking about iniquity. And God says, I still got that. Now, remember, so, so here's what I want to make clear. What David is talking about in the rest of this psalm when it comes to forgiveness is for the trifling of the trifling. And don't look at anybody else. Just raise your hand and be like Paul, chief sinner is I. He continues, though. Look what he continues. He says, he says and I'm going to drop down to verse 8, the Lord is compassionate and he is gracious. And when we think about this idea of gracious or grace in relation to God, we're thinking about how God gives us, of course, something that we don't deserve. But here is what gracious actually means. Remember, he's, he says he forgives all the iniquities, all of the iniquities, all of our wickedness, our intentional decisions. But look at what it says here. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. And here's what those two words mean, almost two separate words, but have the same meaning in one phrase. It means that God has a disposition to give you favor and blessing. I don't know if it's hot or what it is with y'all today. Did y'all hear what I just said? We are wicked people who intentionally fall, but the movement of God is he looks at those wicked people who make intentionally bad decisions and says, how can I give them favor and blessing? All right.
But do you see the scenario that sometimes this, this kind of thing is, is creating, I think, in our minds and why it was hard for us to celebrate that? Because you grew up being taught that if you do wrong, how on earth can God bless you? Come on now, let's keep it real. I'm going to go back to the most basic thing. You go to a theater, wrong, angels depart. This is what you taught. This is what we're taught. Same thing. Do this on the Sabbath, and this isn't going to work out for you. Do this here, and it's not going to work out for you there. And so we've got this kind of thing where how on earth could you accept forgiveness from God and blessings from God? Because the only way you think you get blessed is if you live in right. And if that were the case, come on, y'all. That's such a trick of the devil. Because now, inherently, we think that some of the blessings that we get are because of the things that we do and not because of the mercy of God in spite of what we do. And so now what the devil does is he even takes the mercy of God and flips it as something that we think we did for ourselves. David also says this. Oh, thank you, Jesus. It says, he is slow to anger. Abounding in loving kindness. Uh, uh, the Hebrew word there for slow and anger is like a nostril. I said, what? I said, God, what are you talking about? It says, here's what it says, steady breathing. I said, man, what, God, what do you mean by that? Um, Shannon, uh, you trained me along with Ron and, and some fighting. And one of the first things they had to get me to do, they said, Mike, you can do all the technique in the world you want. If you don't breathe the right way, you're going to get tired before everybody else. And sometimes if you ever box and you get up there, and you, <clears throat> I, I, you could do that for about one minute, and I'll let you do it. Boom, boom, okay, oh, oh, oh. And then after that, I'm going to beat you up because you're going to be too tired <laughs> because your breath is just gone. And so now, you know, one of the things that she ain't got to do, he's like, dude, relax. And you can tell when you relax. And not only do you need to relax, but you need to relax, not just when somebody's hitting you, or not when you're hitting somebody, but when somebody's hitting you. Because if you get hit, when you tense up, then here's one of the things we'll do. We'll just keep throwing at you so you <laughs> tense up, and you lose. You can't breathe the right way. That same thing transferred over into uh, my Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And so what is the most important thing is these folk that I'm you know, doing stuff with are three times, four times as good as me. But here's one of the things that I learned to do is in the midst of tension, when my arm is being pulled this way, when my legs are being pulled the other way, is I control my breathing. Even keel. And so now that I'm even keeled throughout that, I can last longer in the match. I can deal with my thing the way I need to. Here's the reason why. I don't lose my cool. I keep my breathing. And here's the thing that I love about God. When sin starts happening in our lives, he does not lose his cool. He keeps an eddy, a steady breathing there. He doesn't, oh, I can't believe y'all did this. I can't wait till y'all get you. No, know, God is just... We got that picture of God. We got a picture of God. Oh, can you did that. He's slow to anger. And that's why God can go all night with us because he doesn't get tired. He's just there, steady breathing. Because he's slow. He's slow to anger. He's slow to anger. That makes sense to me you say amen. And look what he says here. I'll just give you two more, then we'll close. But he has also not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. I need you all to hear that. God does not give you what you deserve. But you know what our problem is? We love to play God because we say God must have missed something here. And so if you did wrong, but nothing bad happened to you, then God must have missed something. So let me step in and do it for God. And here's what's crazy. We'll do that with each other, but we also do it to ourselves. Because at the end of the day, I just got to be real. God does not deal with us according to our sins. That's the Bible. The stuff that we should get because of our mess, we don't get. 
This is this God. This is who it is. He continues, for as high as the heavens are from above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so as far as he removed our transgressions from us, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. How can we walk around not feeling forgiven when the Bible talks about this? Because back in Eden, y'all can come play softly for me now. Back in Eden, let me tell you what happened. The first thing that the devil did, and he's still doing it now. He was successful in Eden. And 6,000 plus years later, he's still getting us. The very first thing he did was to get them to distort the image of God. And that's why the moment that they sinned, they did not run to him. They ran away from him. Because they could not fathom a God who could cover that. That's us. And it's manifested in ourselves. How can he forgive the abuse? How can he forgive the decisions? How can he forgive that? I'll tell you how. He's God. That's what makes him God. And I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, I tried to figure out the best way to explain it. But he said, son, this is it. It's just who I am. Now, I'll tell you what's going through your mind right now. This is how we think. This is how the devil gets. I'll tell you what's going through your mind right now. But pastor, where's the accountability? You see, I'm going to tell you why I wasn't taught this coming up. Because people were afraid that if I learned this about God, I'll just keep sinning. If I learned about all this forgiveness, and guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to keep sinning. I'm going to keep doing all this and come to God for forgiveness and do all that. So what we did as a church, and religion has done this, is because we don't want people to do that, we got to hold them accountable. Let's put as many rules as possible in their face. And, and, and some of the rules will be Bible, so that'll be it. But we'll mix in some that, that fit with our rules tradition and, and all this different kind of stuff and we'll put all that together and we'll hold people to it and let them see that if you fall and you don't do this rule then that means you must not be where you need to be with God and you got to be held accountable and we'll actually kick you out of the community because of some of them we'll gossip about you we'll label you because something's got to hold you accountable because I'm sorry sometimes with some of us here it is we're like where's the accountability iniquity I can do what I want to do Know that's wrong and God's still going to forgive me? Like, where's the accountability? Where is it? Where is it? It's nestled right there in the text. Because remember, the one who's writing this is a dude who's after his own heart. And look what he says here. So great is his loving kindness, verse 11, toward those who fear him. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, fear is not this idea of, I'm scared of you, but simply put in the Hebrew language, fear simply means someone who is in relationship with Jesus, relationship with God. So the question you say, okay, pastor, then what is going to hold me accountable? And I'm going to tell you what God expects, because this only applies to those who are walking with him. You want to know what holds us accountable? It's not the rules. It's not the law. It's the relationship. Because you see, let me tell you what David's problem was. His problem wasn't God, oh my goodness, I need forgiveness. Hold me accountable, do all that kind of stuff. He's like, God, I know I've got forgiveness, but here's my problem. I'm tired of breaking your heart. That's what should hold us accountable. I don't need rules. I just need to know that the thing that I've done has busted my God up. It's crushed him. It's broken him in pieces. So yes, God, thank you for the forgiveness. Thank you for covering my iniquities. Thank you for compassion. Thank you for grace. But even in spite of all that, I'm tired of breaking your heart. I'm tired of coming home, being late, and you waiting in the bed for me while I'm out there with some other God. And looking at your face and seeing what I have done to you. Ain't nothing more accountable than that. And that's why God says, I can give you this much grace. I can give you that much forgiveness. Because if you're walking with me, your relationship with me holds you accountable to me. 
That's what it is. And if I'm in relationship with God, if I'm truly walking with him, then I embrace this. Because if God can see me like that, then I can see myself that way too. And even when nobody else can forgive me, there should be two people on this planet who can. God and myself. And somebody here today needs to forgive themselves for something. Something you've been holding on to. Ain't been able to let go of it. It's got you. And you've gone through all the steps, but here's the ultimate step I need you to go through. Today, I need you to embrace the forgiveness that comes from Jesus Christ.